Good afternoon, friends. Hope you're doing well, having a great summer. My name is John Bay. I am a managing partner here at FS Insight. As some of you may know, we launched our digital assets research, uh, blockchain crypto research back in July of 2017 and our consulting service uh, back in November of 2018. Since then, we have consulted over 20 protocols, companies, exchanges, and miners, and it continues to grow today as space has become much more mainstream. Today, we will be highlighting a very special protocol, uh, AVA Labs. Uh, AVA Labs is an exciting decentralized smart contracts protocol for financial applications. Simply put, Avalanche offers a completely new method of consensus and a level of customization that just doesn't exist with other layer one protocols. We are elated to have our good friend and president of Ava Labs, John Wu, joining us today. John has a tremendous background both in financial markets and crypto markets. I actually worked with John uh, a few years ago uh, selling and trading Asian equities. So indeed, he is a very good friend of mine. He, along with my colleague, David Greider, uh, who heads up our digital consulting, will discuss, explain, highlight um, Ava Labs today. Before we get started, uh, my dear partner and co-founder and head of research, Tom, will give you a brief intro and uh, overview and his thoughts on the crypto market. There will be a Q&A. As always, at the end of the presentation, you can ask a question using Q&A button at the bottom of your screen. And also we will be sending out replay information uh, after the webinar. As always, on behalf of my colleagues and my partner, uh, we are grateful for your support and business. Feel free to email us at inquiry at fsinsight.com with any suggestions or thoughts. Again, thank you. And I will now turn mic over to my partner, Tom. Um, I want to give just a sort of set up the conversation for today by talking about AVA, especially in the context of the broader crypto market. Um, for those who follow crypto, as you know, this has really been two chapters so far in 2021. For the first four months of this year, crypto markets rose sharply. Bitcoin hit 64,000 and uh, really ran into some congestion. Uh, two factors, I think, really played the biggest role, but I, there's probably some others. The most important, I think, has been China's very systematic crackdown on both mining and crypto trading and, and really trying to limit the usage of Bitcoin. And the second is the U.S. government's both tax scrutiny and regulatory scrutiny of not only crypto and on-ramps and off-ramps, but also stable coins. And I think sort of to a tertiary extent, there has been some meme and key opinion leaders who uh, sort of shifted their view on Bitcoin. I think most notably would be Elon Musk and the whole ESG arguments. So for the past four months, crypto has been range trading. Um, I've been impressed that it's held that 30,000 to 40,000 range, especially in the face of I think pretty steep negativity. And if you look at sort of the broader macro influences at a time when the economic resilience has come into question given the mutations and transmissibility of these various COVID variants. But we think this is all ending. So as we look into the final four months of 2021, in our opinion, the global financial markets, including crypto are setting up for like a, what we'd call an everything rallies um, into year end. So a broad based risk on rally. And part of it has to do with the fact that the Delta variant really does seem to be peaking in places like the UK and in the US places like Florida. And for those who are clients and regularly receive this data for, as you guys know, for the past year and a half, uh, we provided regular updates on, on COVID trends. But I think it's really critical to see COVID peak in the second half and especially in the next couple of weeks. So um, where does that leave us? Well, I think the potential remains in place for Bitcoin 
to rally above 100,000 in this sort of final four months of 2021. And that's not a huge order of magnitude rise from 40,000. But within crypto, I think that's going to set up for a much stronger risk on rally or much greater upside potential for a lot of other projects. So I think included in that category are projects that are really innovating what crypto does today, something well beyond just uh, a store of value and something beyond just DeFi, but some projects that really attempt to, to really move crypto beyond those two things. But equally important, I do think it means you, you wanna find projects that can actually capture value. So they're doing something unique that increases their value as more users use it, but they don't run into scalability problems. And so with that as a setup, I'm gonna turn it over to David Greider. Uh, as you all know, I'm David Greider. I'm the head of uh, digital asset uh, research here with Fundstrat. And uh, we have you know, done a number of reports on a number of consulting clients, as John mentioned, and Ava Labs and Avalanche is one of them. And that's what we're gonna be going through today. And I'm very much looking forward to it. It's one that uh, we're you know, very interested in and, and uh, we think has a lot of potential. Uh, we have sent out the report, so everyone's in box, please make sure you have it uh, handy, and we're going to kind of flip through some of that. Uh, but first, I want to go ahead and introduce uh, John, who is on the call with us. He's the president of Avalabs, and, you know, some things that, you know, obviously John mentioned they'd worked together in the past, but I'm going to give a little more background on John, and just so folks can have a little understanding of him. He actually comes from a very, you know, traditional uh, background, you know, from really understands kind of as an investor, kind of what it takes to be, uh, you know, a protocol like this to kind of have value and kind of work for kind of building um, for investors. So John used to um, be the CEO of the digital assets group at shares post for the private market trading. He also had, you know, a half billion dollar fund that he ran himself, a hedge fund, and he uh, worked at, um, you know, some very notable large buy side shops from Tiger to, to others. So uh, with that, John, I'm going to introduce you and then we can maybe get a little of your background and start going through the report. David, thank you. And I'm a, it's a pleasure to be here with FSI. And uh, thank you, Tom. Thank you, John. They are correct. I've known them for quite a few years. Um, and as a buy, buy side uh, investor for most of my career, in fact, I've been listening to them, not just at FSI, but also back to the days of JP Morgan, um, listening to Tom's uh, strategic calls when he was chief strategy officer, and even before then, when he was uh, the probably, I would consider the best telco analyst around. So it's been a pleasure to listen to them and their advice on the markets. I would listen to them if I were you, because they are generally right. And um, what I hope to, to get out of today, and I'm hoping I'm putting myself in your perspective, because a lot of the people on the other end of this call are probably investors and people who have been on the buy side or are on the buy side where I came from. Um, so four things I would like to cover today with David's help. One would be uh, picking backing off of what Tom said. If this markets for crypto and Bitcoin can go to 100,000, he suggested that some of the alternatives, such as you know, Avalanche, which is the protocol for Ava Labs, um, has a chance to go up even higher. And the reason for that, in my opinion, is because the space is finally showing utility. We, at the peak in the space, saw over $150 billion of value in the, in the DeFi ecosystem. Um, and you have more than one now, a, a couple of unicorns in the NFT space, funded by venture firms in equity. And then you have payments that are working and obviously the enterprise private blockchains have been there for a few years. So use and utility is a real thing. So if we have a good risk asset on play, the alt alts, as Tom suggested, probably have a better run than even Bitcoin, in my opinion. The second thing I wanna get across is why Avalanche um, is, a more efficient platform because of the scale, speed, and uh, finality that it can achieve. Then third, because uh, we are probably you know the youngest first layer protocol, we've only been on the mainnet for about 10 months. Um, I would like to highlight some of the things that we look forward to in the next few months. And I think there's some very exciting developments, both on the technology side, business development side, as well as um, partnerships. 
And lastly, I know what you guys all care about, and so did I when I was in your shoes. Hopefully, we can talk a little bit about how to make money in DeFi and how to do it, especially on the Avalanche protocol. Um, yeah, so as we mentioned, obviously, we sent this report out to folks. It's the full report we did a while back. We um, abbreviated a few um, of the slides here to kind of focus on some core ones. And I think the first one that we're going to kind of focus on is, John, if you could talk us through maybe the difference between just Avalanche and Avalabs real quick, and maybe some of the folks that are backing you. I mean, it's kind of like, you know, Avalabs is like the like the red hat to kind of the, the open software network. Maybe maybe talk folks through that and kind of what your mission is. And kind of what, That's right. Uh, so uh, thank you, David. Avalabs is the software and services company. I'm the president of Avalabs. The creators of Avalanche, the protocol, and that can be easily found on CoinMarketCap uh, with the ticker AVAX. And like I said before, Avalanche, the protocol, is a next generation blockchain. Um, it's Ethereum compatible. And think of it as Ethereum with features that are Ethereum 2.0 before 2.0 comes. So you can do a lot of the things that hopefully ETH 2.0 will be able to do today. And I think what makes Avalanche um, very special is that our ultimate goal is not just to play in the DeFi sandbox. Our ultimate goal is to digitize or create a platform that allows easy digitization or tokenization of the $700 trillion of assets that sit on financial services and banks balance sheets. A lot of that, about half of that is illiquid instruments and, and, and products like real estate. Imagine when those things can actually be tokenized and actually uh, fragmented and be able to be transferred in a compliant way to individuals providing more access to everyone instead of just the insiders club who can play in real estate or art or other things like that. Um, one more thing I'll say here is I think Avalanche, the protocol is uniquely positioned because it has, I, it's the only one that really is on one platform allowing uh, developers and enterprises to all work together from both a private blockchain perspective as well as a permissionless blockchain perspective because the technology is built so that you can have a, small, a subnet on top of the permissionless. And last thing on this uh, very um, detailed slide is we're obviously funded well by not just some of the best blockchain crypto VCs, but great VCs in all of Silicon Valley. Yeah, and you guys have a pretty stellar team, right? Maybe talk us through a little bit of that. Yeah, a big reason this team, and this team is actually a reflection of the whole firm. The firm is about 110 people. And we purposely uh, put together world-class people in every level. And they have, um, to be a great blockchain company that's attacking the markets we're attacking, you need great computer scientists, cryptographers, you need pragmatic, call it quote unquote, Wall Street people like myself. And we wanna be regulatory compliant. So we went out and found one of the best GCs in the space. So the team is stacked in terms of uh, multi-discipline and well, um, well tenured and great track records in all of those areas. Maybe talk us through a little bit of the history, right? You guys have been around for, for not too long, but you guys have done a lot. Yeah, I and mean, I think there's a lot of words here, but the key point to note is we've actually only been on the mainnet for about 10 months and the achievements for 10 months is quite good. So the firm was created in 2019. Eamon Gunsir, the founder, was a well-known distributed systems professor at Cornell. He and his team of PhDs created a new consensus protocol and wanted to commercialize it. And in 2019, he went out to the A16s, the uh, polychains, the initialized capitals, and we raised our first round then. I think there was about 10 to 15 computer scientists and me, and now today we're at 115 people around the world, three offices on the mainnet, and um, lots of other achievements that we will be covering in this slide deck. Yeah, and I think, you know, maybe if I can just frame it up for folks, uh, the way we kind of see where you guys fit within the context of, you know, both crypto within the context of the kind of broader internet evolution, and then in a minute, maybe within the kind of crypto evolution, you know, and this is a slide that we've 
shown a lot of our viewers in the past and different variations of this. And it's really thinking about how crypto is kind of like this next wave of the web, All right? If I want to contextualize it for folks who think that these kind of new blockchain um, networks should really be thought about as kind of this next evolution from things like, you know, the base layer protocols, which are really kind of this new type of cloud kind of edge computing, decentralized computing layer, as opposed to the centralized cloud layer. And it enables all of these, you know, new applications that I'm sure John's going to dive into that are being built on top of their uh, protocol with many of them being, you know, internet native finance and embedding that in there to like these, these dApps that are community owned and governed. And I think that's really a new paradigm that is kind of disruptive and it's kind of a rising tide that, you know, could benefit crypto and, and John and Avalanche. John, what are your thoughts on that? So David, I agree. I think blockchain will usher in a next generation of the web, web 3.0, as you call it. You know, truth be told, I benefited very well from web 1.0, web 2.0 as an investor, a tech investor, as you guys mentioned at some buy side shops. Um, when I first got into this space as an investor, I thought the value proposition of a lot of these companies um, about providing more efficiency, giving my life uh, an easier way to access certain things, either via e-commerce or uh, be able to see content from you know, an online perspective. And, and then the companies were able to make money by selling me information, selling me goods through the internet. That's web 1.0. And that was great. Things became more efficient for the user and the companies deserve to be bigger and bigger. The whole space was about 1 trillion as highlighted here in the graph. Today, I think there's like four or five companies in tech that are 1 trillion market cap and over. Somewhere between web one and web two came social media, uh, network effects really took hold and also mobile. Data was now everywhere. So what happened with that is, I think a lot of these companies in order to continue to grow at the rate they have been growing, have gone past providing you more efficiency, you trade off some privacy for that, but you get value out of it to the point now where actually they take your data, your PII, your digital identity, so to speak, kind of hijack it from you and they make more money from it every single day by serving you things that kind of manipulates you into doing things that you perhaps didn't even want to do, like showing you things to buy that you probably don't need, but they know you'll have an impulsive way of buying and then you end up buying it. So I think we've gone past the stage where these companies were just serving you. They're just serving themselves now and taking advantage of your digital identity. This is why Web3 with blockchain, trustless dApps and a DeFi integrated ecosystem will give users back control of their own data, privacy, and hopefully capture some of that value that is now being captured in lots of dollars by these large behemoth tech companies. I think that's a lot, a lot of great thoughts, John. I, and I think like if I'm, you know, really framing in the context of, you know, where you guys probably sit within that kind of crypto evolution within Web3, right? I think that it's important for folks to maybe have like a picture of how we think like about crypto maturing as, you know, uh, technology and as an asset class and kind of the investment landscape, right? I think the wave one of what you saw with kind of crypto, these internet economies was this digital money, right? And, you know, that was the Bitcoins, the Litecoins of the world. And I think about wave two of kind of the crypto evolution being like the, you know, the cloud native applications, the cloud platforms that, that are like Ethereum that enabled these, you know, digital businesses to be formed within these economies and those digital businesses allowed for, you know, kind of layer two things on top of them, like um, many of the financial protocols you see for DeFi, where you had not just a money, but, you know, a financial economy develop. And I think that now we're in this phase where, you know, the wave three of crypto maturity and applications and use is really kind of taking that digital internet native economies that we're building and taking them to kind of the next wave where you interact with, you know, more complex things like, you know, social media, digital, decentralized social media applications and NFTs and really take that whole digital world and put that there and on chain. And that needs kind of some new scalability and technology requirements. And it doesn't mean that, you know, one wave has to eat the last or that, you know, each is going to be a killer of, you know, Ethereum is going to kill Bitcoin, but it means that you can grow the pie and, and do incremental things that add utility. John, I mean, would you agree with that? Or do you have any other thoughts maybe to add? 
Absolutely. Just like the previous slide where Web 2 built on Web 1 and Web 3 is building on Web 2, if you extend last slide, Web 3, Web 3 actually has three waves, as suggested by David. The first wave was, frankly, Bitcoin. It basically taught us what the Internet of Money was all about, and digital money, and how that can exist. Today, as Tom earlier mentioned, we kind of look at Bitcoin as a protection against inflation and a store of value. But what Ethereum did after seeing what uh, Bitcoin was about was realize that in order to create utility, you need to be able to have programmability on top of the core platform. And they created a new, uh, basically a, a protocol that allowed programmable smart contracts in order to create use cases. In 2017, we saw the very first use cases in the ICO boom. Unfortunately, they weren't always compliant in the US, the regulatory landscape, but it did show what a global crowdfund race could lead to. Very fast raises, very low costs, and giving access to a lot of people around the world for things that you cannot get elsewhere. Now, what happened after that was though, you have these ecosystems primarily developed around Ethereum. There's buyers of things, there are developers of applications. However, the platform wasn't scalable. It wasn't fast enough. There were potential capacity issues. So yes, you had an ecosystem of things going on, but as David said, you want to build an economy ultimately. And you didn't have a true economy until you can have seamless, fast transactions that are scalable and no latency. So wave three is a bunch of new protocols that try to build on top of what Ethereum did and provide the scale, provide the speed and provide the finality so that you can have lower costs. Avalanche is one of those protocols. And I can't wait to go into uh, our low fees and the scalability of that platform. Yeah, maybe that's a good place to kind of talk about how you guys um, are doing that with some of the different ways you approach the technology. Absolutely. So it was Gunn's vision that in order to provide those three things, scale, speed, and um, finality, you had to start at the very base layer, the consensus protocol layer. And throughout the history of distributed systems, there were actually only two paradigms or two uh, consensus protocols. One was the classical consensus protocol. That's actually been around for 40 years. That is basically where everyone in the network has to talk to everyone else in order to validate and secure a transaction. So it has the N square problem. Sure, it's easier one or two, maybe three people. But once you get past like 100, everyone has to talk to everyone else. That's not really scalable. And it's basically, it's not really decentralized. So that's why a lot of actually private blockchains do use the classical protocol. Um, in 2008, roughly, Satoshi Nakamoto came out with the Nakamoto consensus protocol, and he solved for scalability and decentralization. However, it's the longest chain uh, consensus protocol, and the issues became latency and um, no high you know, throughput was not good. And obviously, because um, Bitcoin was uh, proof of work, it's not really green. That's very important today, as opposed to in 2008, 2009. So when Gunn and the team at Ava Labs coming out of Cornell, they wanted to start at the very base layer, the actual consensus protocol. And that's what they started doing. They created a subsampling consensus protocol, taking the best of classical and Nakamoto. So the very foundation of it is an improvement and provides better access to the, the trilemma that we just discussed. Yeah, maybe talk us through some of the other aspects, John. So after the consensus protocol, call it that the math and the cryptography and all the stuff that involved there, the actual blockchain architecture, again, with the goal in mind of solving that trilemma, uh, the, the most efficient way to architect a blockchain was to actually create a network of chains. We have a X, P, and C chain at Avalanche, and each one has specific functionality. So therefore, when it's all combined in the uh, network of chains, Again, you're, you're solving not just the consensus layer, but also at the blockchain architecture layer now for the scale, the speed, and the finality, leading to lower costs and more capacity capability. So you guys are doing 
you know, some interesting things. I mean, obviously you have some community supporters that have built, you know, this bridge here. This is one interesting way to kind of get some liquidity to avalanche across different chains. And we can maybe talk about what bridges are and how they work in a little bit. And I, th I think you maybe have an, another one you guys are launching. Maybe tell us a little bit about that. Yeah, this is the fun part. This is the part about, again, we covered a little about utility in DeFi. We've covered a little bit about the efficiency of Avalanche. Now we're going to talk about stuff that um, is happening in new technologies that will be happening on Avalanche and new stuff that's coming out. So yes, the first bridge was uh, uh, launched by the community, I think roughly about three or four months ago. And that's saw quite a bit of success. There was plenty of Ethereum assets that want to come over to Avalanche and try out these features, the speed and the lower costs. Um, and that was good. However, it was a community driven bridge. The bridge served a purpose, but it was still expensive, especially on the Ethereum side. And it was a little slow and the throughput was not as good as uh, everyone has hoped though. So it was not very easy uh, to be fair to get across the bridge. With that in mind, um, the team and as well as the community have been fast at building a new bridge, an XGX bridge. XGX is a chip invented by Intel that has a lot of processing power and has certain characteristics of it that makes it trustless. Um, I won't go into the details of that, but the point is today, this morning, we actually launched the new bridge and this bridge will surpass the previous bridge by 10x in terms of scale, speed, and then the pricing of coming across that bridge. Yeah, and I think maybe one just kind of analogy to frame it for a lot of traditional market folks, like what these bridges are, is, you know, we talk about crypto uh, blockchains kind of being these self-sovereign economies of their own, right? And it's kind of like, you know, Ethereum and Avalanche, kind of like the US and China, where, you know, you have these different economies and you can have stocks issued in each one or assets and like, you know, for example, we have tech stocks that would trade in the U.S. because they have ADRs, which which are, you know, the bridge, per se, to the U.S. market. I mean, that's maybe one way to kind of help think about, you know, how, how folks kind of um, move assets across this kind of Internet native economy. Is that is that about right, John, or anything else you'd add on, on, on this? That, that's a great analog with the ADRs uh, providing, for instance, like U.S. people access to Chinese stocks. Although these days, given what's going on, I don't think you really want those ADRs. That's a different point. Um, but more importantly, I think the world of blockchains going forward is going to be interoperable. Generally, bridges, in my opinion, will be able to connect different first layers. Assets and people will be able to freely move around. And ultimately, first layer protocols will all be known for certain features or for certain capabilities. And then people will end up at the place they want for that specific goal, but also have the ability to move back to a different, different ecosystem um, when they want to. So I guess the analog would be, if you're in Manhattan right now and you want a really nice dinner and pay a lot for fine drinks and wear a nice suit and put on nice shoes, you go to Manhattan. But every once in a while, you may wanna put on like the t-shirt and the shorts and the Birkenstocks and go across to Williamsburg you're probably still paying a lot for it, by the way. It's very expensive, Williamsburg. But at least you can go there and have a different atmosphere because it's a different feeling. So in the long run, these bridges will allow that seamless movement. And um, that's probably the promise of the entire ecosystem, in my opinion. Yeah, I think it's really exciting. And I think, like, you know, back to what we were talking about with kind of the Wave 3 and kind of enabling, like, new types of applications. I mean, we're obviously, we like Ethereum, but we think that there could be other um successful protocols as well just like you have you know aws and, and microsoft and alibaba right so you guys have a kind of different approach to the market with lower fees and maybe talk about what that's enabling and kind of how you see you guys positioned yep i think it's very important to note here the differences in fees i think this this study was written uh at uh, i guess in may of well actually somewhere between may of last year and may of this year probably you know september time period of 2020 um Really what it's highlighting here is that um, the fact that what we talked about with the efficiencies of Avalanche, it allows you to charge a lot less. And there were a lot of, call it, uh, people crossing that bridge, the Williamsburg Bridge, over to Williamsburg and trying out a new system. I mean, I remember fees on Ethereum 
being 50 to $70, depending on the processing power needed for the transaction for like $10 NFTs. So that's kind of onerous to pay, you know, four five, seven times sometimes the price of the actual physical good. Whereas that same transaction on Avalanche was anywhere from five cents to 50 cents. And this is again, talking about things that are coming out, there will be updates and improvements to the core platform that will lower these fees even more. And that's something we're very, very excited about. And maybe talk us through some of the applications that are kind of taking advantage of you know, your technology and your lower fees. So I think when this was written, there was about 168 projects. Today, there's over close to 300 projects, 70 which are live. And as the ecosystem grows, it's, there's a network effect and there's a synergy and there's a compounding loop of success because whenever you have certain tooling that is done, and just about two weeks ago, we announced a partnership with Chainlink and providing you know, the Oracle for price feeds. Now we have the lending collateral um, dApps ready to go. So they were already building on top of Avalanche. And now with that functionality, they're ready to launch. That's gonna lead to the next iteration of, of dApps. So it started with the bridge, then there was AMMs, and there was like seven to 10 of them on Avalanche, but nothing gets a financial ecosystem going more than collateral, lending, borrowing, and some leverage. So now that lending and borrowing is there, expect more derivative type, insurance type dApps in the next layer. So every single day, this ecosystem is growing and compounding on the previous successes. And maybe talk us through some of the ways you guys are kind of... Um helping kind of spur that growth as well. Yeah. So one of the things that's uh, very exciting and it should be exciting to some people on this call because um, we have a grant program and the purpose of the grant program is to uh, allow great entrepreneurs, innovators, give them something so that they can start building and building on top of Avalanche. There are, in, in, in this case, I think it's exciting for people here because we've actually married or paired up people from the financial services industry who have been doing something in the traditional finance way, know the functionality, the product or the service very well. And they've had the vision of encoding that and creating a smart contract to replicate those services on a blockchain. We pair them up with developers and other people who understand solidity or blockchain development. And there are literally projects that we've helped with grants that are now gonna be launching and these are people just like you who know financial services, came from financial services, but wanted access to great developers. So that's an exciting thing for just about anyone who wants to be an entrepreneur. Yeah, I think that's incredible. I mean, you guys have obviously seen a lot of folks who kind of want to be entrepreneurs and launching across different segments um, on Avalanche. Maybe tell us a little bit about what you're seeing, where these dApps are kind of, uh, you know, forming on your guys' chain. Yeah, so the one on the screen there is old and the one in my background is newer because there's more, uh, we've had to like shrink all the logos in order to keep printing um, all the partners we have or all the dApps on top of Avalanche. The point here is with purely from an organic perspective, we haven't even thrown incentive programs like some of the others have. The number of dApps that want to launch or are launching or have launched on Avalanche is extraordinary, simply because of the superior technology. The rest of the summer, you're gonna see other things besides grants that will also jumpstart, not from a tech perspective, maybe from a business development or a capital perspective, a faster and even uh, greater growth in this ecosystem. Like I said, it's over 70 live dApps and another 230 that are building and ready to launch in the next couple of months. Yeah, it's really exciting. Maybe, you know, I think there's a lot of, you know, people can get confused when you think about what these dApps are and what they kind of do and maybe use cases, maybe just kind of drill into like, let's talk about one or two of them. Sure. I think this one is important to highlight because we want to be digitizing real assets and we're very focused to help Avalanche be the platform for DeFi and for traditional digitization of financial assets. However, digitizing an asset in a non-fungible way versus a fungible way 
is actually not that different. The platform's set up so that it can do both relatively easily. And the point of this slide is that there are actually a lot of NFT um, projects and dApps that are deploying on Avalanche using the same core technology. In fact, Avalanche, um, Labs, I should say, the company has uh, struck a strategic deal with Tops, and we have created a NFT market already for them for one of their properties, Bazooka Joe. And I would stay tuned for a lot more similar um, partnerships going forward. Yeah, maybe talk us about this one a little bit. Yeah, so this is very exciting because it's not just digitizing exact similar assets that exist in the traditional world. This is actually creating a new way of doing things. Litigation finance is actually a large, large market, but it's played by uh, an insider's club of very you know, strong law uh, people, lawyers, as well as you know, private equity firms that really know the odds of litigation. We found a great way to actually create what we call an ILO. This is an initial litigation offering. This will be literally a new asset class being launched. And this will take some of the economics that some of these uh, private equity investors get and then allow individuals to also partake in a very lucrative market that really is, frankly, an insider's game of very few people. And um, to take these, again, hard to find assets and hard to invest type stuff and providing that access to everyone, especially people on this call. I bet you most of these people on the call, including myself, have never really invested in litigation finance and not realizing that it is actually quite lucrative. Yeah, I think it's pretty exciting kind of the new things you can do with some of these digitizations. Like I think, you know, you guys obviously have a lot of apps that have kind of launched and, you know, you guys are still, you know, growing in your kind of maturity phase, right? Obviously you came a bit later after, you know, Ethereum and Bitcoin, but, you know, I think your fees have been, you know, from the start, at least growing much faster than theirs did. And, and I think that's kind of maybe one thing to really think about for folks who look at these networks and digital assets from an investment perspective, because, you know, we think that these things, you know, have to have kind of fundamentals to stand on in the future, right? As these kind of digital network economies and digital network businesses, you know, have to, um, you know, be valuable from a fundamental perspective. John, maybe tell us a little bit about, you know, how you guys view that and how that's kind of been, um, you know, maturing and growing over the times that you've launched. Yeah, um, I think this slide is really highlighting one big metric that I think people should look at, which is fees burned. Um, the fees burned is a very good indication of use on a blockchain because there could be fake transactions or just transactions of messages back and forth. And that's really not creating any real use. But if you have to pay for transactions, then there's less likely that you're just creating a bot to, to, to do things. So obviously comparisons will only be correct if you do 10 months out us versus 10 months out versus other people. However, when this was done in September, even not adjusting for uh, lifespan of a protocol, uh, we were one of the top, uh, Avalanche is one of the top protocols in terms of fees burn. And, that, and what's impressive here is, like we talked about earlier, fees on Avalanche are like one one hundredth of that on other places. So that means there has to be a lot of transactions in order to even be top five of this, of this uh, list. Um, Ethereum, obviously the largest, the most transactions, but remember, a lot of those transactions were also done at 40, 50, 60 dollars, not five or 50 cents. Yeah, and I think it's important. Maybe I'll just spend one second to kind of help people understand like the fees burn mechanic, right? Like it's it's like a company when you kind of, you know, you have money coming to the business and then it goes to the PL and, and it hits that income and then it goes to equity as you buy back shares. And that's kind of the same fundamental kind of cash flow value like mechanics that you know, can underpin those same assets that many people are most, you know, are used to investing in. So I think that that's the way to think about it. Uh, one perspective for for a lot of these crypto networks and you know with that i think that's the the full presentation i think we've had actually a lot of great questions it looks like kind of build up in the q a um i will stop sharing here and i'll hand it over to john to uh john bay to uh let you guys kind of do q a thanks dave and thanks john for that wonderful uh presentation 
extremely informative. We have a lot of a uh, lot of a lot of tricky questions here. Okay, let me just start going down. John, can you provide any insight into possibility and timeline of Coinbase listing for AVEX? So to answer that uh, without uh, tripping any NDAs, obviously I think the audience or what they're asking is how can US people get access? Again, the point here is that we're so new, it's hard to get access. And to get access, especially in the US, that functionality will be coming very, very shortly. Thanks, John. Uh, okay, next question. Like crypto mining is dependent on heavy use of computer and data storage, what type of infrastructure elements enable success of Avalanche and alike protocols? So these new generation of pro first layer protocols are all or most of them are proof of stake as opposed to uh, proof of work, which is where mining requiring energy burn and requiring hardware. Most of the proof of stake um, are a much lighter weight solution. And the solution is actually locking up capital in, you know, in, the, in, the, in a staking format and getting paid for locking that capital in order to validate transactions and secure transactions, as opposed to uh, proof of work where you have to have mining rigs, et cetera, and you have to fight for the ability to actually, with better mining, better hash rate in order to um, secure that and validate that transaction. So Ava Labs built Avalanche with that in mind, wanting to be lighter weight um, and the equipment required to do um, proof of stake through Avalanche is actually the lightest of all the first protocols. Any individual can do it. We want to be really decentralized, allow everyone to partake in governance, validation, and security of the network. That's part of the reason why there's more validators on the Avalanche network, a thousand plus now than any other protocol. Thanks, John. Okay, here's a, here's a here's an interesting question, a little verbose. Among layer one smart contract platforms, I've become convinced that Avalanche has the best technology. However, I do not believe that the best technology always wins out. What I really hope to see from Avalanche is the ability to capture mind share by dis dis distinguishing itself from the many other platforms that make similar or even bolder claims, albeit deceptively. What would help with this would be the third party validation through partnership with very well known companies, similar to Ethereum Alliance in 2017. Do you have such a partnerships? And if so, will you be able to announce any of them this year? So this is a great question coming from someone who really knows the space. They are correct. Um, as we've highlighted, we've led with technology as a moat for us because that is one of the strengths of Avalanche. And the answer is yes, for the partnerships and the alliances. And that's part of the stuff that we didn't get to cover more in the presentation because of time constraints, but that's part of the stuff that we're all very excited about in the very, very near short future. Okay. Uh, okay, next question. John, who are some of the big investors in Avalanche? You mentioned backing. Uh, in your presentation, but can you be a little bit more specific? Sure. So um, I think in the presentation, and it's well, it's on our website. If you want to check, there's a list of them. But for convenience, I'll list some of them. Andreessen Horowitz, A16, obviously. We had um, Polychain, one of the, you know, Olaf and his team are one of the best at investing in, in blockchain and crypto. You had Initialized Capital, which were the former Reddit guys. You've had, um, um, Naval from Metastable, you know, Naval Ravikan, well-known luminary in the space, as well as in just tech in general. You've also had um, guys like uh, uh, Galaxy, Novogratz, um, and a lot of the other more crypto-centric, well-known, um, call it crypto funds and investors. It's easy to find on our website. It's all disclosed. Thanks, Sean. I, I think next question might be for... Uh... 
um, my colleague, David. David, are you there? I am. Dave, how is, uh, how is Avalanche different from Zillica? You know, I, obviously, look, I, all of these, you know, crypto platforms kind of have different approaches um, to the way they do things like consensus and to the applications that are built on them, to the community, to the, to the market that they're kind of focusing on. You know, I, I, but I think like the way to really think about it for, for a lot of folks is like, just like you have, you know, Amazon here, like an Amazon web services here in the U S and you have like Microsoft, um, and Azure, and we have, you know, in, in, in Asia, you have like Tencent, you have, you know, the Alibaba cloud, right? Like there's kind of different crypto computing platforms serving kind of different markets and, and different use cases and customer bases. And I, I think that that's kind of the way to think about it at kind of a more, you know, high level as opposed to kind of digging into that nitty gritty, like how, how does this different um, technical features work? But, but yeah, I mean, that's, that's, that's the way I would kind of describe it. Thanks, David. Uh, so, so John, can, can, and does Avalanche replace ETH? Okay, so first I wanna make this clear. We don't view ourselves as Ethereum killers. Um, we view ourselves as complements to Ethereum. We provide functionality that ETH 2.0 will have one day. We just have to have it now. We were very successful in taking some of the excess capacity, the overflow when uh, pricing was very high on Ethereum. Um, and the way I think about this space, I think there's too much about us versus them or them versus the other person. I mean, there's like a couple hundred thousand developers in Solidity on the space. There is 7 million uh, app developers on Android and like three on Apple. The space needs to work together, grow, and let's worry about getting to the millions of developers building on, 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 on blockchains and crypto instead of worrying about killing each other or whatever. Thanks, Sean. I think next question is for my partner, Tom. Tom, are you there? Yes, I'm here, John. Tom, what impact do you see for the crypto in the effect of crypto on stock market from recent actions of the Chinese government? Uh, Wes, I, I'm not exactly sure what the question is, but um, you know, China's taken some deliberate actions across many industries this year. You know, it started with, it actually started with Bitcoin and crypto by essentially a wholesale banning of mining across the country and restricting a lot of use of Bitcoin. Um, but it's since moved towards uh, other industries like education and even ride sharing. So uh, to me, I, I think that the broader story is that, you know, China is not taking steps just against crypto, um, but they're really taking steps against what look like private sector activity. And as one of our uh, research analysts has pointed out, you know, China essentially has been nationalized companies until 1978. So the history of China as a private enterprise is really a short 40 years. But uh, the fact that Bitcoin has been able to peak its head above 40,000, even in the face of like what looks like a discredited news about Amazon just shows you, I think Bitcoin is beginning to recover. And that to me is a signal of broader risk on across uh, outside the US, I, I think when most emerging market investors have excess capital, I don't think they're buying EM equities. I think mostly they're buying crypto and Bitcoin these days. So the fact that Bitcoin is rising is really a signal of risk on by EM investors. Can I have one quick point to this, Tom, uh, for folks? I just, I wrote about this a little bit last night in kind of the Crypto Weekly, so I would encourage you to kind of check that out. But I think one other point that I brought up is, you know, what happened when property rights came into question back with Cyprus in 2013. And that was really the spark, you know, they had the bank 
um, confiscation of bank accounts back then. That's really the spark of kind of the bull market wave for, for, for crypto, much smaller assets, small island back then. And then the other thing I would think about is, you know, back in 2016, a similar thing happened with the demonetization in India and the bank notes. And, you know, I think a similar, you know, effect could possibly maybe come into play with China if you had digital yuan and CBDCs. And so I think that's maybe another thing to think about when folks are thinking about how China could impact and play. Thanks, Dave. Thanks, Tom. Uh, John, how does Avalanche compare with uh, Cardano? And is this space getting crowded? So I don't believe Cardano has smart contract capability just yet. Um, I don't think the space is getting crowded. As I highlighted earlier, if you just use one metric of number of developers in this space, the answer is obviously there's a long runway to go if you compare it to other parts of tech. And if you look at even in this sell-off where all the alts as well as Bitcoin sold up heavily, you know, as Tom mentioned, Bitcoin went from 60 down to like 30, cut in half. Um, the amazing thing is the volume and the addresses created in DeFi have actually continued to go up. Maybe the slope was different, but the, the, the volume aspect was and the number of wallets or um, addresses created in the DeFi ecosystem have been going up. TVL is absolutely, uh, actually down. That's because it's price times the volume, but the, the, um, the count is going up. Got it. And, and can you highlight the difference between Avalanche and Aave? And what? Uh, Aave? So Aave is a lending plat adapt. Avalanche and even Cardano is actually the underlying protocol. The way to think about it would be um, the virtual machine of like, in, in, in crypto, it's a virtual machine, but think about Avalanche is more like Apple iOS and Aave is more like a Facebook application that sits on the iOS. Uh Okay, what impact will release of Ethereum 2 have on AVA, if any? So I think Ethereum 2.0 has been delayed again. Um, again, Ethereum 2.0 is hopefully will create some of the features and functionality that exist on Avalanche already. Uh, again, like I think people will have their choice of where they wanna go. And when Ethereum 2.0 does arrive, there will be different features and different dApps on perhaps the Avalanche platform for people to, to go into that ecosystem for certain reasons and you know others to go to Flow for NFTs maybe and others to go to Ethereum. The way I see this space playing out is one day it's going to be like the social media networks where you have perhaps a winner like Facebook take most but not all and then you'll still have Clubhouse, you'll have TikTok and you'll have Snapchat. Uh, because they represent special specialty capability that the others don't provide as well. Okay. How many nodes are currently supporting Avalanche versus Ethereum? So there are more than 1,000 validators on Avalanche. Um, Ethereum is still proof of work right now. And um, it's, I, I believe it's under 100. So um, we are... Uh, very conscious of the fact that Avalanche is the most decentralized, which in theory means it's more secure and more people can have governance. And, and what are the validator requirements? Okay, so the one thing that people should be aware of is that the validator requirements from a hardware perspective, the actual physical uh, box is relatively low because it's very software based. Uh, the only thing that is required is 2,000 um, a Vox in order to participate and validate. Great. Jeez, there's so many questions here. Just give me the, the Q and A I see keeps going higher than you can speak or I can speak. That, that's the problem here. They, John, need what is the best... they need to offload to another higher capacity call. <laughs> John, what is the best way to gauge app development on blockchain platforms like Avalanche? 
I think uh, there's a couple of things. And, and that that question is very intelligent, driven towards like development communities, sounds like to me. So if you look at the Discord channels for Avalanche, it's well over 20,000. And that's a, um, a chat, basically, application heavily towards um, driven towards the development community. So that's one metric. You can look at GitHub repositories to see how much code is being done. And you can look at commits, which shows you um, codes for the core platform. So if you look at all of those three metrics, it's very clear that, um, and you compare relative uh, age associated with Avalanche and other first layer protocols, um, it's clear that Avalanche stands out. And what's other also clear is that if you look at the growth rate of those uh, metrics, it's it's a double to triple digits. Okay, one great strength of Avalanche is you will allow permission subnetworks, actually a continuum of permissions. When will that become available? Will the permission subnetworks be like company intranets? So it, this is uh, someone obviously who knows a uh, decent amount of Avalanche, so this is fantastic. So some networks for the rest of the um, audience is kind of like a private blockchain in a, in, a, in a strange way. And it's a very good way for financial service firms and enterprises to have more governance. One of the big barriers for financial services firms to tokenize or digitize assets, financial assets, it's because in general, there's a lot of regulatory and compliance requirements. And just putting a whitelist, you know, through code on a smart contract of who can and who cannot, or a blacklist who cannot, it's just one little barrier. There are just so many subtleties based on geography and different assets. A subnet allows enterprise on, on Avalanche, allows enterprises actually to choose their a validator set and to choose the governance requirements of that validator set. So allowing them to be more compliant. And the unique aspect of subnets on Avalanche is that that sits on top of the permissionless core platform. So there is an easy entry into the permissionless world, future-proofing a lot of these private blockchains when the permissionless world is actually um, you know, liquid enough for their choosing. John, you have a history in regulation tech. Any thoughts on general regulatory landscape? How do you, how does regulatory risk affect AVEX? So this person asking it clearly knows uh, me at least pretty well. Um, as you guys highlighted, most of my career was spent as a tech investor on the buy side, looking at great business models from small to large, early stage to late stage. But for the last four and a half years, I've uh, spent as an operator, first as a CEO of the digital assets group at Shares Post, trying to tokenize in a regulatory compliant way private shares and funds. So this question kind of hits that part, I think. And um, I probably spent an inordinate amount of time and killed many brain cells working with the SEC to do a change of membership agreement to make it possible so that an ATS can also transact a um, token, if you will. I think that was the first step. And that it's, it's a great improvement. It's not like the wild west of 2017 security token market is actually starting to pick up, especially with the combination of reg A+. But going forward, I do anticipate more and more um, guidance from the regulatory um, bodies here in the US. And I think any blockchain company that wants to be compliant should welcome it because Part of the problem in the US right now is the guidance is not clear. So there's a lot of entrepreneurs who are actually starting things offshore. There are places in you know, Europe as well as Asia that the rules are probably a lot clearer. So they're, they, they're, they know that they're not gonna trip some rules by accident. So I hope we don't lose a lot of great talent and guidance continues to come and get better every single day. John, what are, what are the ways to buy AVEX in Canada? Well, um, I don't know if Tom mentioned it already, but uh, there's a publicly traded company called Voyager, and um, that's one way to get access. And they trade in Canada. Okay. 
I think we have time for a couple more questions. Um, John, you talked about the different uh, use cases for Avalanche on slide 14. Among those, can you mention, talk about some of the best institutional uh, use case for Avalanche? So I don't exactly remember slide 14, but as a, as a, as a regards to institutional use cases, there's a couple. Um, first and foremost, uh, I already announced that we have a partnership with TOPS in the NFT space. So that is uh, providing you know, NFT marketplace for a well-known uh, storied brand. Uh, anyone who used to collect a baseball card when they were a kid knows that, that brand. Also, we're working with uh, financial services firms. You know, I can't go into specific names on their NDA because it's still in process, but I'll give you an idea of what we're working on. With the infrastructure bill going through, there's players out there and there's a large construction loan market out there. Again, similar to litigation finance, it's a clubby world. It's OTC market. Things don't trade easily. You have to know the counterparties. It's almost like trading a stock in 1920, 30. You just got to find who the other and uh, other side is. So there are players out there who want to make that market more efficient and have provenance in these loans on a blockchain and digitize those assets so they can have better price discovery and so they can trade uh, in a more uh, flexible manner. Another one will be uh, uh, factoring. So accounts receivable and this is actually in a uh, emerging market and, on, and similar case here, it's an OTC market. Sometimes there's no, people will try to resell uh, their accounts receivable twice to different people um, because the record keeping is just not that great. So this company is also trying to uh, show provenance on a blockchain and digitize the uh, factoring uh, marketplace. So that's another example. So a lot of these examples are, um, serve a couple of purposes. One, they are either illiquid assets looking for better price discovery, or they are looking to create more access to individuals like the ILO, because it's a clubby world. And frankly, a lot of the tokenization or putting it on a blockchain uh, may, automates a lot of the workflow and cuts a lot of costs out in terms of creating the uh, digitized version of something. Uh -huh. Okay, two more questions, John. Um, wh what is your view on going forward on Bitcoin and Ethereum? And how, how, does it, how do you think that affects the outlook for AVEX? So more and more, I think you're gonna have the alts uh, take a higher percentage of the, call it market cap of um, crypto. We've seen now Bitcoin go from 60, 70% share down to about 40% today. I think the use case of Bitcoin is really cementing itself as a digital gold or store value. And the trust is there for that. But Ethereum and all of these other alts are really in the world of uh, utility and use case. And I do think all of these, uh, there's gonna be some correlation because again, we talked about it, how a lot of these layer ones work and feed off of each other and also these dApps. But I really think that the share of the crypto market space for Ethereum and the alts and you know, the aboxes of the world that are providing utility will increase and Bitcoin will become a lower percentage, but it's still a very important percentage. Okay, final question. John, what are, what, what are some of the concerns you have? What, what keeps you awake at night? I mean, is there anything that may slow down the avalanche? No pun intended. So, uh, listen, I think the number one concern with any person running a business that what I would consider hyper growth in a hyper growth industry is that we don't innovate fast enough. And a lot of um, these protocols, we talked about how certain people have better features, other you know, architect is better, et cetera. But all parts of the engine, whether it's business development, marketing, or, or technology, has to be on the cutting edge and constantly innovating. And there's a lot of strong 
uh, players in the first layer space, all doing that. I think the, the easiest winner is going to be the end user when people can get higher yields. We didn't get to talk much about um, how to make money in DeFi, but the, you know, the end user wins. In the meantime, there will be um, all of these players basically trying to innovate on all fronts faster and better and to a pace that you've never seen before, frankly. I mean, people thought the internet um, changed things in the 90s and innovation was incredible and new things were doable. That's gonna you know, be times five in the blockchain world of Web3. Okay. Well, with that, uh, I wanna thank John for his time and his insights. Uh, this was absolutely fantastic. Um, and I'd like to thank uh, all the attending, attendees for joining us today. Uh, without you guys, uh, this is not possible. So I look forward to seeing you guys on our next webinar. And on behalf of Tom and my colleagues, thank you for your business and support. Have a good day. Thank you very much, John and David and Tom. Thanks, John.